Uh, again, as you've listened online or you've listened or you've read ahead on Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. He had said this unto his, unto his disciples. Now we're going back and forth. It started all the way back in chapter 9 and he's going to a Pharisee's house and then people are watching these things. So there, there's a few sections. In the first part of the Gospel of Luke, he says he's come to seek and save the lost. The first few chapters up through chapter 4, the middle of chapter 4 of Luke is where he's come. Talking about his coming and how he's coming. We're in that section from the middle of chapter 4 all the way through about the middle of chapter 19 where he's come to seek, where he's, he's, he's come to seek and he's going to uh, seek in those things. And we see all the interactions, we see all the inner things that are happening with Jesus Christ and all the things that have happened along the way. And from the middle of chapter 19 through the rest of uh, the Gospel of Luke is where he is performing, where he is now set to Jerusalem. I think it's Luke 19, 28 or 24 where he says, now I must go to Jerusalem. And that's where he's going to save now. He has come, the first uh, section, he is here to come and to seek. And that's what he's doing. He's seeking. He's going out. He's finding. And now he's now, again, from chapter 19 on, that will be the part where, again, where it focuses in on how he goes and he pays that price. He's, so now this section right here in Luke 16, now he's turning this to his disciples. When he was, the last chapters before, when he was talking with the Pharisees, or he's in the Pharisees' homes, people were all around the Pharisees' house. Remember how that works? It's a, it's a, it's a gathering there. It's sort of that's the show. You can come in there and you can look into who are the guests that they have there. And people get here. And he's talking to the Pharisees, but yet the, the people outside are listening. Now he's out walking with the disciples, again in the last chapter, talking about the prodigal son and, and those things, and, and the lost sheep, and the going after the one, after the, uh, leaving the 99. And now he's turning to his disciples. They're still spending the Sabbath day with Jesus. He just exposed the false attitude of the Pharisees with his parable of the prodigal son. We also see that the key word in that transitional phrase is also. He turns to his still, and he, now he's also talking to his disciples. Again, this is Luke chapter 16, 1 through 13. That is, he has turned from the Pharisees and says to his disciples in their hearing. The Pharisees are going to hear this as well. Luke 16, 14 tells us that the Pharisees also heard all these things. There was a certain rich man. Now again, he's, he's teaching his disciples and some others are going to be here. So there was a certain rich man and he had that steward. And he was accused of wasting his goods. A steward, though a servant, was put over his master's affairs and his goods. One of the chief characteristics of the steward was that he was to be faithful. He was a trusted servant. He could be a great asset to his master, or if unfaithful, could be costly. The steward in our parable was not faithful or diligent in his duties in managing the affairs, so he'd get fired. All right? And so here he was called by his Lord to make an accounting of his affairs, and that he was going to be fired. So what does he do? The steward was faced with a dilemma. I can't dig. <laughs> I'm ashamed to beg. His solution was call in his Lord's debtors and reduce their bills. The one that owed 100 measures of oil, he said, write 50. To the one who owed 100 measures of wheat, write 80. The idea was to use the authority he was soon going to lose and to obligate those, put them in contrast to, to his master, he's, gonna, he's somehow going to be indebted to him. They're going to owe him. I can't dig. I can't do the manual labor. I'm, not, I'm too proud to beg. So he's going to get this and turn this around for his, for his own benefit here. Uh, and the Lord commended the unjust servant. Not, not because he was dishonest. He said, well, I, I guess there's some good at this whole thing. <laughs> you see, the end is coming, so you were very wise. It was the steward's Lord who commended him, not for what he had done, and that he was dishonest, but for what he had done, not for his dishonesty. For the wisdom of looking ahead and using his present position to gain advantage for the future. Our Lord calls him an unjust servant. Jesus comments, For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. What generation? This generation. That could be said right now. That, that the, the people of this world, that's why you hear me often comment about, hey, well, even the world gets this. Even the world can figure this out. Even the world's got this thing down. Oftentimes, when I step into a room or whatever, it seems like people stop thinking, and all of a sudden, what, what should we do? And, and my response to them is, if I wasn't here, what would you do? How do you function? I mean, I'm not with you at work. How do you do that there? Do you have a what would chick do bracelet or something? I mean, how do you make it through? The, how did you make it this far? What would you do? Well, I don't know. We would do it. Look, the same hole is going to be dirt 
as a Christian and a shovel, you're going to have to dig a sand. And just as you're going to dig dirt on your job, if that's your job. I knew a guy, that was his job. What do you do? Dirt. I dig dirt. What do you do? I just dig dirt. That was his thing. He had a good shovel. And so I, I knew this brother. You remember the brother I'm talking about? Yeah, we go back and ocean. Anyways, that's what you talk to this brother. What do you do? Dirt. I dig dirt. Anyways, anyways, Jesus comments... For the children of this world are in this generation wiser wise than the children of light. And again, note that the wiser generation, their generation is now. Look how the wise world is selling its products. Take a rotten product like beer or any of this alcohol, and look how they glamorize it and make you think that that's real living. Just having a can of beer or a cigarette and living the high life, man. I'm just, I'm digging it, man. You just drive by the, you know, back in the day, the Marlboro man. Now oh, it's a man. That's a man. You ever seen the end of that billboard? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, I'm just all for that. Just, oh man, that just looks glamorous. I just got to get me some of that. And one of the ugliest things in the world is a long cigarette hanging out of a woman's mouth. Yet look how they've glamorized it. Look how they've glamorized it. Oh, whoo. Like, no, no. I, I often tell people, I had family members, they said, man, give me a kiss. My grandmas or aunties and all those. Like, no, no, if I miss you, I'll just kiss an ashtray. <laughs> Might be good advice for some of you here as well. Look how they put their product in the best light and make it think that you are missing out on life if you don't have it. That's the whole thing with advertising. I've got to have that. I've got to have that. Because you know Christmas is coming. got to have that. Got to have that. Look how the gospel is so often presented to people. They are surely not wiser in the eternal things. Uh, this is that they're very foolish in. So sometimes the gospel is presented in such a way that it's just, it doesn't compete with the world. And, and when is the world going to take from the, the Christians and, and copy those things? Well, we really want to, we want to see those things. And we want to see, I mean, we take our songs. You've heard those comments and those cartoon songs and things like that. You know, I mean, I mean we take, you know, secular songs and we Christianize them. Like, I got a Jesus-loving woman. Or, I wish they could all be wholesome Christian girls. And things like that. And the Lord's coming back and you're going to be in trouble. Hey now, hey now. The Lord. But you've heard those. What if the other one Christian comedian, they take Christian songs. Our God is an awesome God. How about, my Dodge is an awesome Dodge, it rams. Oh, I mean, you can do, you understand? Krispy Kreme, Krispy Kreme, what I long for. Chris, I mean, then we hit them some fighting words. They're going to start taking it. And yet we, we laugh and they joke at that. But look how they present this whole thing and the, and the advertisement and the bombardment and over and over again. Two all beef patties. All right. See, you know that one, right? Special sauce. Yes, so many of them. All right. Make yourselves friends by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, that you may be received into everlasting habitations. It goes on. Money is not an evil; it is the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Not the root of all. People, you misquote that verse. Plainly. Money is the root of all evil. No, no. Money is the root of all kinds of evil, but money is amoral. It's normal. It's either good. It's neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it which constitutes which is good or bad. You can use your money for good purposes. That was what Jesus is encouraging here. Use your money to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You can set it on ahead. That when you fail, not just morally, or, but I mean, it's talking about here, it's biblical language, but when you die, and all of us, the death rate is the same per person, one per person here in America. All of us will one day fail. We will die. The moment you die, you lose control of writing checks. You know that? You lose control of that. When you die, you leave everything. You know how much Howard Hughes left behind when he died? All of it. I do. I really, really do. I do want to get a hearse. I want God to give it to me. And I want a U-Haul trailer behind it. And I want signs on it. What's wrong with this picture? You don't see a U-Haul behind a hearse. You don't do that. I'm going to drive all along town. <laughs> they think you're crazy or whatever. But it's not crazy here, is it? Is it, Judah? It's not crazy here, is it? That's just normal, right? That's the new normal. All right. Well, there will be those who are in heaven who receive into the everlasting habitations that are there because of your investment in the kingdom of heaven now. That's why we get to participate with people who are coming back and sharing what they're doing in the other part of the world. That's the investment that we're doing now that we're able to put into their lives and do those things. And these are the rewards that we can store for ourselves, treasures in heaven. Um, he, is a fa uh, he that is faithful in the least is also faithful in much. Again, he turns this figure of the steward. He has been entrusted with this master's good. He is faithful in the little things, but the steward wasn't. He wasn't faithful. He's being fired. Reminded of the parable of talents. 
What are, what are you doing with the things of God that He's entrusted in your kingdom? Remember, as He gives the parable of the talents, He gives the ten, He gives the other one five, He gives the other two, and the one with the other one says, well, you were a hard man. You were a hard man, so I just buried it. And then I brought, here you go, this muddy, dirty, crusty, here's your talent back. I just buried it. I did nothing with it. It's just like you gave it back to me. It's pristine. It's an antique. It should be worth some more, shouldn't it? And so here it's like, no, I'll take that away from him and give it to the one who has ten already. And you want to hear good and well done and thy faithful servant into thy rest. Those are those things. You, you want to be entrusted. You haven't been trusted. If you're faithful with the little things, be faithful with the greater things. That's why, again, when you read or see the documentaries of people who've won the lottery or whatever state they're in, the, the, which I call a tax on the poor, they, they win this whole thing, whatever, and then they're broke within a couple of years. Because if a person can't handle five bucks, ten bucks, a hundred bucks, or a thousand bucks, they're not going to be able to handle a million bucks. It's just gonna, it's the same way. A survey was given that people who are below the poverty level and they are below the 14,500 poverty level, uh, they said, well, what would you need to live and survive? Oh, if I just had $30,000 a year, that, that's all I would need and, and, I would, and I would be okay. They asked people who were in the thirty to $50,000 range, what about you? Oh, if we had $100,000, we would be doing good. They surveyed people who were in the $100,000 to $200,000. What if, you, if we had a half a million to a million, we would be better. Really? And that's what the whole thing when it comes to being relative, where you're at, and you think that you're going to be serving and doing these things. So here, again, reminder of the talents. He that is an unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If God can't trust you to handle prudently the little things like money, money's not the big issue here. If you can't handle the, the little things like money, the parable of this commodity, how is he going to place you in keeping with the true riches? The little things in the context is this mammon. Mammon was a god, by the way. It was a god of money. It was a god of finance. Not just finance, but of gold. It was just this monetary thing here. All that we possess, listen, if you're taking notes, all that we possess is really, it really belongs to God. He has placed us in our keeping. As a father with his children, as a pastor with the shepherd, I, I give an account to you. You can read through First and Second Timothy. Uh, you can read through First and Second Peter. You can read through all these things and in Titus and realize that that I, as a pastor, I will give an account of my life as one first and foremost my relationship with the Lord, then as a husband, then as a father, and then as a pastor, a shepherd. What have you done? What have you done with the finances of this church? What have you done with the people's lives? How have you reached, teach men and send? And you given, and that's that whole thing. He has not given them to these finances or these resources or this mammon to squander upon ourselves, but to use it wisely for His glory. To use it wisely for His glory. If we are not faithful in caring for these little things, then again, He's not going to entrust us with these eternal things. No man can serve two masters. This is the object that Jesus is going to. And again, He's teaching His disciples. The Pharisees, everyone else is listening, but He's, he's taking this thing. I mean, He's talking right in front of them. The Pharisees are there. They're listening. He says, now look, just just them. This is what not to do. Uh, I'm right here. That's why we're going to get to the verse. They, started, they heard these things and they started to write him. Like, hey. In fact, when you read through some of the other Gospels, some of the Pharisees are, are pretty bright. They say, hey, I think he was talking about us. And Jesus goes, right, yes, I was. The key word here is no man can serve two masters. The key word here is serve if you're taking notes. Serve. The two masters are God and money in this context, in this passage. Some are trying to serve both, but you, you cannot be mastered by both. You can't serve both. The Pharisees who love money heard all these things and they derided them. That's what it says right there. The Pharisees who were covetous, who were greedy, but yeah, these were the spiritual men. These are the people who had people walk in front of them. Uh, you know, Pharisees coming, or the high priest is coming, or the righteous man is coming. Get out the way! Get out the way! No one touch him. He's on his way to the temple. He'd be paying for us and all these things. They were covetous. They loved money. They heard all these things, and they started to talk bad about Jesus. Luke sixteen eleven. Again, this subject is the true riches. The story again begins with a certain man, the steward who was in charge of, the, of these things. Again, called to give an account. Understand this, that each and every one of us will be called to give an account of our lives. It is. And what we've done in this life. The steward was found in himself, again, this dilemma. So he struck up a crooked deal. He cut the bills in half. He did all these things. And, and yet, he was not commended for his honesty. He was very dishonest. He was shrewd, is what he was commended for. 
In commenting on the story, a lot of people have problems with this. Jesus said to the children of this world and their generation were wiser than the children of light. How so? You know that your time here on earth, listen to this, your time here on earth is limited. Do you guys realize that? It's limited. I'll be 48 this year. It's still limited compared to eternity. That one day we're all going to die. So many of you, again, mistakenly, absolutely have no provision for eternal future. So let me speak to those two here today. You have no provision for an eternal future. Now, granted, the poorest pauper in heaven is richest, richer than the richest man in hell. Okay? You're going to get to heaven. You're going to get to heaven and you give your life to Jesus Christ. But this is the thing that, it, it's not like, if you want to, you know, if you, if you think about it, put a little savings aside, kind of send things on up to heaven. Jesus commands us to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. He says to do these things. Now, here's something. We do those things, even out of obedience, just do those things, send it off the head. I, I found that there's a benefit derived of that if I'm spending my time thinking of eternity. And, and I don't buy into this. I, some vomitous carnal flesh bag of pus, some dirtbag Christian, try to minimize this thing by saying, you know, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Here's the problem. I'm so carnally minded, I'm no heavenly good. I'm trying to spend the rest of the time that I have in this carnal flesh to be heavenly minded. I don't constantly think of the things of heaven. I am not that heavenly minded. I have not met one other person who has been so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I find that they're just like me. We're really good here. We're, we can accomplish a lot of things here. And it's always, again, this world, this world, this earth is always distracting me. So don't buy into that thing. Oh, oh, I guess, I guess I'm no, I'm just so, I'm always talking about the Lord. Really? How much time? That's one of the things that led me to be a Christian. I would always complain about, you know, God, you know, if God forgot about man. God forgot about man. I was always having my big thing. You know, I thought I was some intellectual, pseudo-intellectual. I was always telling all these Christians, you know, God forgot about man. What about wars? What about this? And what about all these things? And a guy just questioned me one day. He says, Chick, how often do you think about God? Well... But take out all the time she used his name in vain. Oh, man, I don't know. He came up and he did this whole image, just charts and maps and papers and things, and says, you, you think about God about an hour a month. Yeah? He goes, yeah, I don't think God forgot about man. I think man forgot about God in your proof. Oh, yeah, you're right. I guess you're right. I guess you're right, yeah. You know, you wonder why there's problems in school and there's shootings in why there's prohibiting guns in school and things like that? Well, they, they had to remove the Bibles so they could make room for the metal detectors. And you think about all these things, and again, the statements going over, uh, the, the school shootings and stuff like that. It says, why wouldn't there be? You've done everything you can to take God out of the school. What's going to replace it? And if you can, I, uh, I just happen to be privy to some information and stuff, but uh, maybe in years they'll release it. But, but to watch... Uh, Eric Klebel and Darren Harris, the Columbine murderers from years ago, videotaping themselves. And they said, you know, there is no life after. This, and they talked about evolution. There is no life after. This is it. Life just ceases to exist. We've challenged. God couldn't stop us. And they're just a whole bravado. And then they kill themselves. When you raise a generation of people saying that we've come from the ooze to the goo to the zoo to you, when you've done all these things and there is no life, there is no God, and all stuff like that, then what purpose is there? What purpose and meaning and direction is there to life? So they're able to squander these things. You know that your time here on earth is limited. So many, again, are not making eternal preparations. Some people are well off here. And again, they're going to be paupers in heaven. Let us say that for 50 years you have been squandering your riches and doing very little for the kingdom of heaven. You'll spend your eternity in destitute. Again, being the poorest person in heaven and makes you more than the richest man in hell. But we are commanded to store up for ourselves. What is the purpose of this finance? What is the purpose of this man? And what do we can do? It's not bad. It's not good. It's just what we do with it. The application of the story here makes us use of the unrighteous mammon or money. For mammon was, again, this god of money. Then you'll fail. Then you will die. And then you'll receive into this everlasting. Basically, Jesus is trying to say that the dollar is not the currency of heaven. You know, you can have this very strange experience. Some of us have gone overseas and, and the dollar's not really well accepted and you're, you're hungry and you're going to try to buy something and you try to show it with your dollars and like, uh-uh, not going to happen. 
You could have a thousand dollars in your pocket, thousand U.S. dollars, which is about five hundred dollars somewhere else. But you can have a thousand dollars in your pocket, and they're not going to take it. We discovered that as when we were transferring planes in uh, in England, merry old England. Hey, I like that thing you got there or whatever. It's not like that. And they, yeah, pounds and sterlings are euros. I got dollars. And they're like, ha, ha, ha. And standing like, look at this guy. <laughs> All right, that's a dollar. Yeah, that's 40 cents, son. Well, I need mean, five, six bucks here. Oh, now you're up to a dollar. I need this. I got to change it into euros. We got to do all this like that. I'm hungry. And it's just like, you're looking at this big sandwich and now all they're doing is selling me a whiff. That's about it. You have thousands of dollars in your pocket, but you're not working with the right currency. Gold is, uh, gold is not the currency of heaven. That's asphalt. That's pavement up there, folks. In order to buy goods in a foreign country, you need that currency. And again, when traveling to that foreign land. And here's the other thing. I've learned by experience, if we happen to land in that country on a weekend where the banks are closed, I have no way of exchanging my money. So what do I need to do? I need to exchange that currency ahead of time. You get the implication of what's going on here, folks? hope so. You look pretty bright to me. You're okay there. You need to store it and you need to prepare for those things. When you arrive in heaven, you'll find there are no exchange banks there. Have you prepared ahead? Uh, you only, uh, your only opportunity exchange for heavenly currency is now. You get that? Now. That's why all the way through the Bible, now is the day of salvation. Now is the, the acceptable time and the favorable year of the Lord. If you wait until you arrive at the gate of heaven, again, you'll be too late. Jesus said, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Jesus seems to be drawing this contrast here as well of the true riches and the false riches. The false riches are of this world that are measured by bank accounts and material possessions. This prospector... Uh, Again, uh, uh, coming out of the Mojave Desert, believes he found a bunch of gold, a true story, and, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he dies. He dies with bags of gold. And he tries to hike out of the Mojave Desert, and, and he just dehydration and stuff, and he, and he dies. And, and he scribbled a note. I died rich. And they opened up the bags, and it turned, to be, turned out to be fool's gold. You think of that in the stories. You, uh, again, there was this uh, famous wrestler who went over to Europe and wrestled, won lots of money, who did a challenge. He did this challenge and over in Europe, and he won, and his gold prize was $100,000, and he wanted it in gold. On his way back to America, he took the Titanic. And he put that gold belt, and he put $100,000 worth of gold, and the gold and everything like that, and he's wearing all this stuff like that, and he tries to put on a life vest, and the witness says he jumped off the side of the boat and right down. He died a very rich man. But that was his possession. I can't give this up. I want all this stuff. You hear all the stories of that. Some of you might think that you're going to die rich, but uh, uh, not like the bumper sticker says, he who dies with the most toys wins. No, you're dead! He who dies with Jesus Christ wins. Salvation, folks. Don't leave earth without it. You need that. That is your eternal life preserver. The true riches are the eternal riches. Jesus told us not to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where guys like me at one time would break in and take them. I'm going to do it. True riches are not measured by how much you have in your account in the local bank, but how much you have deposited in your heavenly bank account. Listen to this. God, uh, God has an interesting way of accounting your deposits, accounting of your deposits. It's not how much uh, that deposit was, but how much it cost you. Not how much you had on deposit, but how much it cost you. David even said of himself about when he was buying the threshing floor and wanted to sacrifice the Lord, said, unless it cost me something, it means... Nothing. What is the true cost? Remember the story of Jesus standing, uh, standing uh, with his disciples and watching. As all the rich were, again, giving out of their abundance in the temple, giving and giving and giving, and yet this little widow comes with her widow's might and puts it in. And Jesus says, in God's economy, she gave the most because she gave all that she had. These gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her necessity. The rich were coming with this great pomp and circumstances and blowing the trumpets, and they were putting this outside offering. There you go. They had to stop for a little bit. This little widow comes in and puts in her little mind. Okay, time to go. No, more money coming in. People going, ooh and ah. 
James said in James chapter 2, verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this, of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He hath promised to them that love Him? To the church in Laodicea of itself, they said to themselves, We are rich, and we are increased with goods. We have need of nothing. But Jesus said to them that you did not know that they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. But yeah, they, they look at all this physical stuff. Revelation 3, 18 says, I counsel you to buy of me gold refined in the fire, that though thou must be, may be, as, be as rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with the eyes of, that thou mayest see. Buy from me the gold. No, just don't get your gold certificate. Buy from me that gold that doesn't perish. The bottom line is you cannot serve God and mammon. No man can serve two masters. The key word again is serve. Your loyalties will be drawn ultimately to one or the other. We can't do it both, folks. We can't do it all. There are, there are time, there are, again, there comes a time in all of our lives when we have to make a choice between serving God and serving mammon. And you have to. There are many people who have been turned to God by their riches, and there's many who have turned from God because of their riches. You see, the riches are riches. Some turn to God, some turn away, all by that same thing. Today's economic situation is doing that. Which way are you turning? You turn in the Lord or away from the Lord? This current economy is only showing the rest of us where, you're, where you knew your heart always was. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's what I see happen in this present economy. As we started Hosea chapter uh, 1 on Thursdays, we're going through Hosea. Again, as I did that contrast from 10 years ago when I first taught Hosea, I said, you know, there's going to come a time in our economy when, when we're looking at this prosperity, and the prosperity is going to be gone, and what's really in our hearts and what's really about our lives is going to be shown. You're going to see what you're about, and that's what's happening now. So now we're going through Hosea again, and it's from the prospect or from the perspective of like who are poor and destitute. What really is about, what, what is that that really matters? Where are my possessions now? Where are all my friends now? Where are all the things now? Where is all the stuff that I had? What about all these things that I clean? And do I possess things or do my possessions possess me? The bottom line is you can't serve both. Today's economy. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Not where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. That's a misquote. That's not even in the Bible. Where your heart is, that's your treasure. No, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. That's right next to God loves those who love themselves, right? Stitching time saves nine. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Not in the Bible. Good advice. Not in the Bible. But understand this. Money is not evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. Once you have submitted yourself to the rule of by your riches, you have embarked on a life of misery because you will never have enough. You've got all these possessions. You've got to maintain it. You've got to do all these things. You've got to, you've got to do all these things about these possessions. All these things that you have to maintain. And it takes a lot of time. And so here, Paul said, Godliness with contentment is great riches. Understand God's economy here. Contentment with godliness is great riches. Contentment that is missing, again, is that missing ingredient for all of those who have allowed money to master their lives. You've allowed this to master your lives. And now that this God has failed you, I, I praise God for it. Praise God that the economy is going the way it is because, man, then now what's in our hearts is truly coming out. And, and then is it so bad to just be in the loving arms of Jesus? Is it so bad that you've heard it preached and taught that where God guides, He provides? Well, now He gets to. Is it so bad now that we can see the miracles and see God just supernaturally do things instead of we go, these hands, look what I've done here. Mammon is the subject of this lesson from Jesus, but it can also be an idol that gets in the way between you and your relationship with God. He's using the object here of mammon, money, that was the thing, because the Pharisees, and he's talking to them, he says, look, I'm, I'm telling you, these Pharisees, don't be like them. They have leaven, they're full of sin, they're covetous, they're greedy, and they're like, wait a minute, they look good. Ministry or courtship, talking with a brother yesterday, with another brother who was given the option or the choice. They came to me and he was interested in this sister, and he says, I like to court her. I said, well, Bro, you made a commitment to lead one of the Friday night parks years ago when we were doing Friday night parks. I said, I, I, I'm, I, you can do either, but you're not going to be able to do both. Well, I, I know you want to do both, but there's no way 
you can court and do that ministry. But I tell you what, you do the ministry, you're going to get the girl too. You don't do the ministry, you'll be stuck with the girl. All right, I want you to understand that. All right, this is going to go on here. and You're not going to like it. And he says, just give it time, bro. And, he, and, he, and we were sharing with this other brother, single brother, who's just kind of wondering what's going on, and he chose ministry over courtship. He said, you know, that's who you Just don't worry about it. Just go ahead and serve the Lord and do the ministry. And in that time, uh, he was able... And no pretension, no false motives, whatever. He began to lean. And that sister happened to join his crew. Who, who would have known? But he was able to lead her. And she got to experience 12 weeks of his leadership, of his way that he did ministry. And I watched it. We all watched it. And she just fell more and more in love with this guy. At first, she was attracted to this bronze god. Uh, but... But then she fell in love with his relationship with the Lord. If you know what I'm talking about, okay. But anyway, so... And as soon as Friday night parks were over, we're there at the last Friday night, and 30 seconds after midnight, hey, sister. I mean, it was officially all... And it was on from there. But he chose ministry, and I said, I commend it. I'm proud of this, brother. And they have a great relationship today because, again, she was able to see these things. But so many times people say, hey, forget ministry. You can't serve, and you can't do both. Because you're, you're, again, you're, you're doing those things. And so here, ministry of courtship. He chose ministry. Luke tells us that there were some Pharisees who were covetous, who heard what Jesus was saying and to his disciples, and they derided him. This word derided means, again, in the Greek, uh, it means to turn up your nose. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the beginning part of the, the, uh, the word is E-K. It means to do it with disdain and openly. Just, <laughs> and just... I mean, they were very melodramatic about it. You to do this. You've got to convince this person. You're upset with them, just don't go. But just go. <sighs> I like when I love when people do that. I'm pretty mean when it comes that way. When they're just <sighs> and they're just <sighs> oh, hmm. brother. Do you need some tums? Is everything okay here? I mean, everyone, well. If you must know, I, I don't want to know. <laughs> but if you feel the need to spew, go right ahead. I'll, I'll listen there. You don't have to be that way. Again, I know it's necessary for me to teach when it comes about money and about the whole counsel when it comes to God's Word. I hate to teach on this subject because, again, I want you to understand, money is just a sign and a symptom. It's not the issue. It's what we do with it determines. Not determines. It's what we do with it shows us. Uh, again, I did not want to arrive in heaven as a spiritual pauper myself, but I want to. Uh, I want to turn and again. I want to see you guys smiling as well. You need to know these passages. You need to go through this. What true riches are all about? Uh, again, Luke sixteen verses fourteen through eighteen. The Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. Jesus again was talking to his disciples, but now they're listening. Before he was talking to the Pharisees and the disciples, and everyone else was listening. But now he's being intimate with his disciples. How should we use money? I'm just going to go throw it out there for spiritual purposes. For spirit, how is how is you know uh, food, clothing, and shelter spiritual purposes? Well, as long as I have food, clothing, and shelter, I got that contentment with it. I'm not going to be wanting to complain about that. And I can go out and I can preach the gospel. I can go out and live that life. I can go out and do those things. There are things that are necessary. By the sweat of your brow, you will work. God said to Adam. These are the things that are going to happen. So there's a necessity. But the purpose that we go to work for is not to support the government. We go to support and then we, we take care of our needs and the needs of others. You're storing up for yourselves. Make use of the unrighteous mammon to bring men into the eternal realities of God. I did that. Someone took me to task. Again, I've shared this with before. Uh, going out and seeing all the Christians. The goal was the first time we were doing Friday Night Parks, go out and get involved with baseball or softball. Play with people on the park. Get them involved. Do frisbee tag. Something. And I show up and I, it's just the Christians and the huddles in our church. And it was the first one. And people having a, what do we need to do here? And it was hard for them to go out and talk to people uh, in the world. I just don't understand. You folks were in the world at one time. I mean, you're not far from it. And we get into this holy huddle and I see that pull into the parking lot I see a bunch of pagan kids out there I say hey, I got 50 bucks if you can go beat some Christians over there in softball people see me drive into the parking lot I come out of the parking lot with 14 kids walking around they're like where does he I see people's like how does he do that I saw the lips move no way and I'm like way and we go over there and <laughs> called our team the pagans and 
And it was a great game for the first three uh, innings because they were all stoned and drunk. But then they started sobering up and it became batting practice for them. I realized I, I had hired half of the Creighton Durham Hall baseball team. And they're just having, and next thing you know, the first three innings, man, was, oh, we're doing everything is great. And after that, bing, bing, bing. And I said, okay, after 14 runs, it's start time to turn up, be up. And I told these kids, I said, okay, you guys are the pagans and we're taking on the, we're taking on the, on the Christians. And finally after they started sobering up, guys are running the bases because I'm the base coach. I'm like, what's a pagan? Tell you later. And I go back and I share Christ with these guys. I still see them sometimes. Some of the guys who are older now, man. 10, 12 years ago, and they're like, I remember that game. They'll remember that. I don't remember you. I remember you gave us 50 bucks between 10 guys. Split it up. Use, and then someone said, someone came and got in my face and complained. Well, we didn't know we could pay people to do that. Why not? Why not use what the world would use? And as I handed them each their five bucks to tell me, I said, no, no cigarettes, no porn, okay, no alcohol, no drugs. This is God's money, and here you go. Oh, And the one guy says, well, if I exchange this for someone else, I mean, can I? I'm wondering when I get to heaven, if that guy just held on to that five bucks, I can never use that. Why not? Buy someone a meal, do whatever. It's what we do with that money, folks. We should use money for spiritual purposes. We can transfer it into eternal commodities. At this point, the Pharisees interrupt him with derision. They're scoffing, again, turning up the nose, talking out loud. What about you? Like, hey, now, this is what I do. When someone interjects themselves into my conversation, I usually turn around and say, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt you while I'm talking. But they're doing this. They're like, come on, and, they, and they're, he's talking about us. We're doing this, and they're just interrupting. They want to stop that whole conversation. Luke gives us the reason for the derision. They were covetousness and they loved money. The Pharisees were supposed to be spiritual men of the community, leading others in examples of spirituality. We find them loving money, greedy, and covetousness. Jesus said, If the light that is in you is dark, how great is that darkness? That's the things that he points out to them. He said to them, The next portion is directed to the Pharisees. You are they which justify yourselves before men. This was, uh, uh, again, the analysis that he brings to them. It was outward righteousness. Everything was before men to impress men. They were very concerned that men believe in their spirituality. Their religion was external. There was another occasion he called them hypocrites. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had warned the disciples that to, they'd be careful that they did not do their righteous acts before men to be seen of men, for they had their reward. Then as he illustrated the point, the Pharisees' method of doing things was held, was held up as a bad example. Blow trumpets, bring notice to this. Now people seeing you do your acts of right, don't do it to the impressors and not with that motive. But if they do it, if you do that, they see it. Why? They, they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify your Father in heaven. But God knows our hearts. God knows our hearts. Money is just a sign and a symptom. It's not the issue. How you handle money is an outward sign of what's in your heart. Jesus called the Pharisees, he called them whitewashed sepulchers, dead man's tombs, full of dead man's bones, whitewashed. That which is highly esteemed among men is the abomination in the sight of God. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. All your actions, look, your actions do not determine the person that you will be. Your actions declare to us the person that you are. Psychologists and sociologists want to tell you if you behave a certain way, you do this. No, 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 no. Jesus says it clearly. From the mouth flows the issues of the heart. Woe is me, woe is me, bummer me, bummer me. What's the issues of your heart? Just let a person talk. What they're going to be concerned about. You know me. There's things that consume me. Practically in every message, I'm going to talk about the Marines, the food, service. I mean, it's going to come out. I'm going to apply that somehow. It's going to be that way. These are the things because these were foundational in my walk with the Lord. I became a Christian when I was a Marine. And I just continued on in my life with the Lord. I still think I'm 19 years old. I'm freshly saved. My body tells me otherwise. It's going to the Lord one piece at a time. It's going up. The men say, they're saying, it, isn't it just wonderful? Look at this temple. Look at everything that's going on here. Again, man looks at the outward appearance. 
Jesus says, this temple, everything's going to be destroyed one day. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. And eventually we will all see the heart. That which is taught and secret right now will be shouted from the rooftops one day. One day all things will be exposed. Why not live open, honest, and transparent now? Why not just do it now? It's all going to be known. Anything that you think is hidden, what if these people really know? We are going to know. Now granted, we're going to be in heaven. It's going to be perfected, but... But we're gonna, it, it's going to be no, It's going to be found out. Sooner or later, you just can't hold on to it anymore. And you've got to get it with somebody. Tell it now. Get it out of the way. Why hang on to it? The law and the prophets, Jesus said, was up until John. John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet. We see that this was an old covenant that God had established with man. They governed man's approach. They missed completely the spirit and the intent of the law in their endeavors to rigidly adhere to the outward aspects of the law. Leather shoes versus Crocs. I have a friend. And he just goes, I go, why are you wearing Crocs? Oh, well, it's a certain feast day. He's an Orthodox Jew. and He's a rabbi. He says, well, it's a, it's a certain feast day and stuff like that. And we can't wear shoes today. <laughs> well, those are Crocs. Well, they're not leather. I, 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 I just, okay, all right. Look like shoes. You're in it. But you can't wear leather. That's leather means shoes. I, is, is that your? Yeah, that's. But you can wear Crocs because they're not. All right, I'm with you on that one. All right, so here's the thing. There's this. There's this legalistic righteousness. Okay, I guess you're following the law with that. All right. Since the time of the kingdom of God is preached, John came preaching the kingdom of God. He said, "Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand." This is that kingdom where God rules. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. Submit your life to be ruled by God. It's not easy to surrender to the kingdom of God. It goes against my selfish nature. I don't think I'm alone here today, but I'll just talk about myself. I must deny myself and take up my cross. Do, do you see where I'm not thinking about heaven a whole lot? Jesus never says, boy, you, you guys think of heaven too much. You know, there's some things here on earth you've got to be concerned about. You know you need to eat. You know you need some clothing. You know you need some shelter. You need to eat the best food. You need to wear the best clothes. And you need to live in the best house because you're a king's kid and I want you healthy and well. Watching a preacher on television just for comedy. Uh. But to hear him say a damnable heresy, poverty is a sin. If you're in poverty, you're in sin. That's an outward sign that you're in sin. Okay. He also went on to say, man, if there's these sicknesses and the things that you're dealing with, if you've got this cough, that is a condition of your sin. That is God's judgment in your life. I will take a cold any day over hell. Give me a cold. If I could just have a cold for the rest of my life and never go to hell, I guess I would do that. But I know there's a hell. And no cold's going to get you out of it. Even if the Vikings win the Super Bowl, it will not be that cold in hell. I want you to understand that. I will take eternity with Jesus and the Vikings never winning a Super Bowl any day of the week. But Lord, if it's your will, <laughs> this is our year. It's not e I'm telling you, it's not easy to surrender that. It's not easy to surrender that. Someone gave me a Vikings mug the other day. It's on the brain. I must deny myself and pick up the cross. But the Vikings, the Vikings are not the cross. They're not the cross. You know what the cross is? The cross. Dying to flesh, dying to self. Paul said, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. Jesus said, strive to enter into the straight gate. Agonizo. Agon strive to enter into that straight and squeeze. Others are trying to get in there, but you've got you to get in there, folks. You got to do that, and it is easier, and it, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. God has established the law, and it is good, and it cannot fail. It is the law of life and happiness. To violate it will bring death and sorrow. You cannot violate the law without suffering the consequences. Whoever putteth away his wife, and, he, and it seems like he's making this contrast when it comes to the divorce, but look, the strict attitude that Jesus had towards marriage it, and it subsequent to divorce and remarriage had come into conflict with their teaching, the Pharisees. The Pharisees are listening. One of the prominent rabbis at that day, Hillel, Rabbi Hillel, declared that you can put your way of, a wife away for uncleanness or if she doesn't please you. If she put too much salt in the falafel, whatever, if she displeased you, it was so liberal that way that he could divorce for any. And 
If you look at the history of the high priests and his family and the Levites and stuff, man, they were divorcing and marrying each other's wives back and forth and doing all these things. He says, well, I'm not married to her now. I'm married to her. They were just doing wife swapping. That's what they were doing. They were trading. God says, no, you can't be doing that. You go back and you read this. And he's speaking to the Pharisees in. Matthew 19 tells us that they had tried to trap Jesus in this very issue about divorce. Luke 16, 19 through 31 gives us the two characters of the story. The rich man, clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously. The Greek word translated fared means glutton or gourmet. He buffeted, he buffeted his body. The Greek word translated sumptuously is lampos, uh, radically, flamboyantly, a flashy display of his opulence and luxury. He knew what he was all about. He fared sumptuously. A certain beggar named Lazarus, he laid at the gate of the rich man's house. Here, if you're taking notes, this isn't a parable. Jesus has given us a true account of what's going on there and gets into this whole thing about Hades and hell. He's full of sores and lesions and ulcerated running sores. He sought the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Understand this, that not talking about, you know, we have bread crumbs, stale bread and the crumbs. Oftentimes you would use bread as a napkin in this culture, in this time and age, and that was the crumb, and you would wipe your hands with the whatever the sop is, because they didn't eat with the utensils and knives and forks and stuff like that. They, and you would use the bread and you would sop it, and that was considered the crumb. That's what this poor man is longing for. I just want your bread napkin. I want whatever saliva is on. I want to survive. Just, I'm begging for that. But the other one feared sumptuously. The dogs came and licked his sores. A greater contrast could hardly be drawn. One thing common to them both, death. To both of them. The poor man died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The Hebrew word for grave is Sheol. It's a place of the departed spirits. The Greek equivalent is Hades. Prior to his death, Jesus Christ, uh, prior to his death of Jesus Christ, all who died went to Sheol. The rich man died and was buried. No mention of Lazarus being buried, for the poor in those days were thrown on the trash heap of Gehenna. They were burned. Their bodies were burned. So this rich man fared it great. Back in my day, I mean, I thought I thought I saw it all when I saw this pimp son being buried. He was killed in a in a in a dispute. I was up in San Francisco. This is about 29 years ago. Before I was a Christian, I said, man, they, the father, this pimp, buried his son in his son's favorite Cadillac. Had all the oils, got permission, had everything drained on the fluids, and, and buried him in his Cadillac, upright. Paid and had all this money and all this stuff like that. And this caption, is, uh, one of the people being interviewed says, man, that's living. And that's what I thought. Man, that is something, man. Then I became a Christian. That's not living. He ain't, beep, beep, he ain't driving that in pimp heaven. He, ain't, he just, hey, look at me, I got that. I just, that's not living. But that's what the world, he died very rich, but he took nothing with him. He feared sumptuously in this life. He saw Father Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his, bo- Lazarus in his bosom. Going back to the statement that Jesus makes using the unrighteous mammon, so that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. This is something the rich man failed to do. He had his want, he had his life, he had everything here and now. The poor man is being comforted in Abraham's bosom. The rich man is being tormented in the flames of hell. His cry to Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the cool water. So it seems in the life to come, it seems that you have full reasoning and logic and understanding. You know one another. You can have these things. This uh, rich man is conscious of the fire, the flames, of unquenchable thirst, all these things that the Bible describes what it is like being separated from God for all eternity. The response of Abraham, Son, remember. You had it here. And, and not that you had your riches. You had the opportunity to use your riches or not your riches. And to understand this, poor people are just as greedy and covetous as rich people. What's a million dollars to a rich person? Not enough. Okay? Understand this, is they're just as greedy. So understand, he's just using this context of, again, of this mammon. But if you're... Look, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham. He had a capacity of speech. He cried. He could recognize Lazarus. He had sensations of heat and torment. He desired his tongue to be touched with water. He could remember his life on earth and his brothers were also still alive. What the story teaches about Hades is that the poor, that prior to the death, again, they went there. But Jesus says, what about this Abraham's wisdom? He tells the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. He doesn't say in heaven. 
Today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus was still on earth for another 40 days and then he ascended up. It tells us in Matthew uh, 27 that the graves were opened up and the righteous, again, they rose. That's that first resurrection that you and I participate in, that's still participating in this day. He tells that there's a fixed gulf. It was uncrossable from either side. This would explode, uh, again, that whole second, everyone gets a second chance. Look, the only place that purgatory exists is in Colorado. It's a great ski place in the winter. That's it. There is no second chance. There is no waiting place. There is no to cleanse and purge your soul. Hebrews 9.27 tells us, it's appointed unto man once to die and then face judgment. The one side was a place of comfort while the other side was a place of torment. And then when Jesus led captivity captive, it tells us in Ephesians, now, again, as it tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. No one had gone up to heaven before the first fruits from amongst the dead, which is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Then we go to be them. So there's no more paradise of Sheol or Abraham's bosom, but there's people still waiting for their final destination, which is the lake of fire. When we get to heaven, nothing will bother us. Understand this. Lazarus, it's interesting that while the rich man was aware of Lazarus, there's no indication that Lazarus was aware of the, of the rich man. We see that continually throughout Scripture as a precedent. I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to be serving. I'm going to be with Him. What are the other Scriptures? Again, I'm giving to you, look them up in Ephesians 4, 9, Matthew 12, 20, uh, Matthew 12 40. That upon death, Jesus entered into Hades, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, because you will not uh, leave my soul in hell, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Peter said that David, being a prophet, was speaking of Jesus, and his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Second Peter 3.18 Christ once suffered for being, uh, being put to death in the flesh, made alive in the Spirit, that by the Spirit He also preached to the spirits that were in prison. Ephesians 4, Matthew 27, 52 and 53. The Old Testament saints cannot enter into heaven until the sacrifice of Jesus was made. Again, you can see Hebrews 10, 4 through 11. Abraham, again, this, and the Old Testament saints going to be with him. Jesus led them. He went there and says, look, just a mere formality. You want to go with me? I'm leaving. Yeah! Abraham says, this is great. None to get you. You're a good host, Abraham. But we're going. We're going to be led away by Jesus. This rich man had uh, five brothers and he feared their fate. And look what Jesus says to him. Look at what Jesus says to the Pharisees and what he tells his disciples. They have Moses. They have the law. They have the prophets. And even if a dead man was to raise from the dead, they would not believe. Not quite sure in the timeline here. Either Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, had already been raised from the dead. And that way he says, even if a man was raised from the dead, they wouldn't believe. Or in timeline of what comes that, he either had by now been raised or he shortly will, and still they didn't believe. And then ultimately, Jesus Christ raised him from the dead, and they still didn't believe. Let's leave here today with a little application for you and I. Make yourselves friends by the means of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. Money, again, is not uh, evil. It is the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Money is, is nominal, is neither good nor bad. It's what you do with your money which constitutes what is good or bad with it. You can use your money for good purposes, and that, what is, that is what Jesus is encouraging and even tells us to store up for. You use your money to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. The moral of the story, again, spoken to the disciples, that they were the stewards to whom God was given. Look, a disciple of Jesus Christ has been entrusted with Jesus' goods, and everything you have comes from Him. You are responsible for how you spend His money. I'm responsible to God how every penny is spent in this church. And people always want to see the money. Look, folks, we have kept board minutes and records of every penny that's ever been spent since the start of the, this church almost 19 years ago. You're welcome to come look at it. I have nothing to be in fear of. You can see where everything is spent, every reason and why and what's going on there. You're more than welcome to it. And, I'll, and I just put it out there. You're more, you're more than welcome. God will one day give an accounting. I am more in fear of God than I am of anyone here. I want to know. He already knows where every penny is, so I can't lie. So I want to be entrusted. And because, and again, I'm faithful with the little things, I'll be faithful with the greater things. You are wise. Take this opportunity that you have now to set yourself up for eternity. Jesus exposes the fallacy of trusting in science to bring people to Jesus with this whole raising from the dead and the rich man and the poor man. 
We often think that if people would see a spectacular sign, they would be compelled to believe. But what creates faith unto salvation is hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. God, working through His Word, has power unto salvation. The rich man was not lost because he was rich. Listen to that. He was not lost because he was rich. He was lost because he did not listen to the law and the prophets. Will you be lost for that same reason today? That the truth of the gospel, the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ, is that no one has to die without knowing Jesus Christ. No one has to go to hell. No one will end up there. It's not that he was rich that he went to hell. It's because the opportunity he had right now and with the great resources. So that's what it is. The true riches or riches. Riches will either turn you to God or turn you away from God. The lack of riches will either turn you to God or away from God. What you're really about will come out of your mouth and what you're really about when it all will come down to and who you're serving and what you're all about. What does it matter? We're going to spend all eternity with Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. That, Lord, that we can take from your word. That you expose the whole fallacy, Lord, that it does coming by the hearing of the word of God. That your word has the power into salvation. My Lord, all the money is going to show is where my heart is. That's all it is. It's going to show. It's just a signpost. It's just an indicator. But Lord Jesus, may each and every one of us be faithful with the little things, and therefore we'll be faithful with the greater things. Lord, pour your Spirit upon us. And may we not deride you or look and disdain as to one another. But may we rejoice in that which you have freely given to us. May we freely give to others. We praise you and thank you. And God, where you guide, you provide. In Jesus' name. Amen?